Hello, uh, my name is Kevin McCormick. Um, the date is March the 2nd, 2019. I'm sitting here at my computer and I'm making a video and slide presentation. Uh, and this is my effort to demonstrate the basic nature of the Federal Reserve Monetary System. Uh, this presentation is probably going to be 45 minutes to an hour and there's too much for me to remember. So I have it written down here and I'm reading it off of this little screen in front of me. Um, so, um, I hope there's not too much light reflecting off my glasses and things like that. But, uh, anyway, I'm a member of the Green Party and I've been studying monetary reform concepts for the last few years. And this is what brings me to making this video. I'm not an economist and I'm self-educated on this topic. That said, I hope you find this interesting. Uh, the Federal Reserve was created in 1913. Since that time, it has steadily grown in influence and power to the point where it seems that government policy is about little else than serving the demands of the banking cartel and the corporations it finances. This 2009 quote from Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois sums up the situation. And the banks. Hard to believe in a time when we're facing a banking crisis that many of the banks created are still the most powerful lobby on Capitol Hill, and they frankly own the place. So this was said on WJJG 1530 AM uh, mornings with Ray Hanania, and I think that's somewhere in um, uh, Illinois. Uh, okay, so how is it that the banks control Congress or the banks own Congress? The U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, gives Congress the power to coin money and regulate its value. Congress has plenary and inherent power over money, as was confirmed long ago in the Legal Tender and the Gold Clause cases in the Supreme Court. The most famous example is the greenback currency issued by Congress during the Lincoln presidency and the Civil War. However, the greenback concept was soon replaced by a national banking system under the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 1864. There has been an ongoing battle to control money creation and issuance throughout American history. Today, it is not Congress, but private financial interests who have control over the monetary system. In her book, Web of Debt, on page 91, Ellen Brown quotes, an 1863 communication about the National Banking Act of 1863. The few who understand the system will either be so interested in its profits or so dependent upon its favors that there will be no opposition from that class, while on the other hand, the great body of people mentally incapable of comprehending will bear its burdens without complaint. But I think it is misinformation and lack of information and not an inability to comprehend. It really is not that hard to understand, and many people do understand. But the system is never objectively described in the media. For a simple example, if you were to have a magic checkbook where you could write as many checks as you wanted and for whatever amount you wanted and they would never bounce, you might use those magic checks for good purposes or for profit and power, but either way, you would have to protect and enhance your privilege. If you were very clever, you would loan out your magic checks and require repayment. The debt obligation would assure your control. This is a very simple version of the Federal Reserve. This presentation uses interest compound calculations or compounding interest calculations to show the exponential growth of the Federal Reserve monetary system. The exact compounding percentage is not the point, but rather it is to show the nature of the system. So uh, with that, let's get started on the slideshow here. Uh, my first slide is uh, a picture of uh, the Greens for Monetary Reform .org. Uh, website. This is a, a group that I've participated in. Um, and uh, I ask you to take a look at this website uh, for information on this topic and to see the monetary reform solutions that are proposed. Uh, the basic idea is expressed in the NEED Act, N-E-E-D, NEED Act, and the public money system it would create. 
You can search the internet for monetary reform and positive money for other sites on this topic. There has been talk about some different monetary theories or proposals, especially related to the Democrat version of the Green New Deal. But actual reforms that would change the system are not mentioned in the corporate media. So I urge you to look into monetary reform for yourself. So now the, uh, the slideshow focused on the Federal Reserve. Compounding debt and the Federal Reserve money system. This is a photograph of the Mariner Eccles Federal Reserve Building in Washington, D.C. Uh, the Federal Reserve Monetary System. The Federal Reserve is often referred to as the Fed, and it is the central bank of the United States. The system is a blend of private and public characteristics. The Federal Reserve is not funded by congressional appropriations. The Fed includes the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., which has seven members, including the chairman and vice chairman. All of the members of the board are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. The appointments are for 14 years and are staggered, so there is one vacancy every two years. The Fed also includes 12 regional Federal Reserve banks located in cities throughout the country. As described on the Federal Reserve website, that's at federalreserve.gov, the Fed is a central banking system with three salient features. A central governing board, a decentralized operating structure of 12 reserve banks, and a combination of public and private characteristics. The Fed manages the payment system, where checks and bank transfers are reconciled, and the Fed also distributes currency to the banks, holds bank reserves, and performs other functions. The Open Market Committee. Now here I have a photograph of the Open Market Committee. Uh, one of the Fed's more recognizable functions is conducting U.S. monetary policy, which involves influencing interest rates and the availability of money and credit in our, in our economy. Monetary policy decisions at the Fed are made by the Federal Open Market Committee, which includes the seven members of the Board of Governors, the President of the New York Fed, and four of the other regional Federal Reserve Bank presidents. This structure gives the appearance of public governmental control, but in fact the control lies with the member commercial banks. The Federal Reserve Regional Banks Commercial banks that are members of the Federal Reserve System hold stock and elect six of the nine directors in their district's reserve bank. Each regional reserve bank acts as a bank for banks. The most important regional reserve bank is, in New, is the New York Fed, which deals with the Wall Street markets and the U.S. Treasury Department. Despite the platitudes about serving the public interest, the Federal Reserve System is controlled by member banks and operates for the member bank's benefit. I regard the Federal Reserve System as a banking cartel, an association intended to eliminate competition and assure mutual advantage. Once you realize that a cartel controls the issuance of money, that is, who gets funded and for what purpose, and who does not get funded, uh, you do not need any conspiracy theory. The manipulation and control is designed for the advancement of the cartel and is built into the rules and operations of the cartel. Key facts are omitted. A major problem to understanding money is those who control the systems and receive special benefits have protected those privileges by shrouding the monetary concepts in secrecy and confusion. The source of money is rarely, if ever, discussed in the corporate media. Explanations of the money system are not part of business, economics, or legal education. The inner workings of the system are kept hidden and secret. Instead, we are directed by the media to the Fed interest rate policy and a multitude of economics and financial promotions. The fixation is on how to get more money, but we never discuss where it comes from and how it is made. The power to create money has historically been a government power. The U.S. Constitution, as noted, gives the money creation and issuance power to Congress, which is rarely, if ever, mentioned. The Federal Reserve System places this power under private control, where it is used for private profit and manipulation of society.
Fed member banks create money. More than anything else, the Federal Reserve System is a banking association in which the member banks have control of the power to create and issue money. The question of what is money has many answers. Money is a creation of the human mind. It is a means of payment, a store of value, and the thing that makes the world go around. Where money comes from is a mystery to most people. But after a little investigation, you will learn that money in our society is a bank account entry, which can become currency, a payment, or anything else you would use money for. This is based on laws which give banks a special privileged status. These bank account entries make up around 97% of the money supply and are created when a commercial bank issues a loan by crediting the borrower's account. The other 3% of the money supply is made up of coins issued by the government. So the Federal Reserve Note. The combination of private control and government power is a vital aspect of the Federal Reserve. This is demonstrated on the Federal Reserve Note itself, where it states that this note is legal tender for all debts public and private. This is a significant advantage over private banknotes, which may or may not be regarded as good payment. A private banknote system was known as the free banking era in American history, and you can find information on how banknotes were discounted during that time. Yet the banking cartel retains the right to determine to whom and for what purpose it will make loans and issue money. The Federal Reserve System is deliberately made very confusing to most people, but I think the main items to be clear about are number one, private corporate control, number two, creating money to issue by monetizing debt, and number three, the need to compound debt for the system to work. I would say the system is designed so that it can be public or private, depending on which face best suits the banking cartel. Compounding debt. The money system must continuously expand by compounding debt in order for the existing debts and interest to be paid with money created by subsequent debts. This monetary inflation can be modeled using the math of compound interest, because the interest will be the key factor in how much the debt should be compounded to make repayment possible. In very rough terms, the debt must be compounded at a rate that somewhat exceeds the interest rate. This basic mathematical fact is obscured by the constant ebbs and flows in the money and credit system and by economics propaganda. Like compounding debt, compound interest is the process of adding accrued interest to the original principal amount so that future interest is based on the larger amount. This results in exponential growth. The process of constant percentage growth is the same mathematics as compound interest. So you can get the math for compound interest at mathisfun.com slash money slash compound interest dot html. The data series that I use in this slideshow are from the uh, St. Louis Fed, and the uh, link is fred.stlouisfed.org. The data values are generally annual, beginning or ending of the year, and calculations are annual compounding or based on the frequency of the data, if it was monthly or quarterly or something, beginning with the starting amounts in the data series. So we just take the first number in the data series and we compound it from there. The exponential growth pattern. The most important thing to understand about the exponential growth pattern is the doubling time. A rough approximation of the doubling time is found by dividing 72 by the percentage rate. The result is the compounding periods until the starting amount is doubled. For example, 72 divided by 6.6 .6 equals 10.9, or around 11 periods. From wherever you begin on the graph, the amount doubles every 11 periods. I use the 6.6% annual rate quite a bit in this presentation, so keep in mind that the amounts will double in 11 years or, or less. We tend to think of this 6.6% growth as a small rate, but we should be thinking above, about repeated doubling to understand the effect. Once the amounts become alarming, in only a decade they will have doubled again. In the graph we can see how the doubling becomes an extreme change as the compounding continues for many periods. 
The math of compound interest drives the Federal Reserve monetary system. To repeat, for emphasis, money creation is the source of banking cartel power. Money is created through monetizing debt. The loan amount and added interest must be repaid by the borrower, but there is no money created specifically for the interest. This bank account money is also decreased when loans are repaid and money available for debt repayments is decreased by savings. The interest must come from money created by subsequent loans and circulated in the economy. The only way this debt and interest can be paid is by increasing or compounding the debt. The political element of debt bondage is essential for the Fed system. This is enforced by the requirement for performing loans which means the borrower must be making the payments for the loan to be performing. Without this requirement, control through debt bondage could not be maintained. The system creates a chronic shortage of money, not enough available money to make the payments. This creates the circumstances where people can be coerced or enticed into behavior that favors the banking cartel. There is always a need for more money, money which can only be obtained through new debt. This also means that money is only available for activities that support debt repayment. This tends to direct society into activities such as industrial manufacture, military campaigns, financial speculation, suburban development, fossil fuel dependency, and consumerism. An important feature of these activities is they increase the need for money and debt. The banking cartel is not going to finance a path to reducing debt which would reduce the banking cartel's influence. We see that monetary inflation or compounding debt is a fundamental part of the Federal Reserve monetary system, but this is disguised by the term economic growth. So also, the compounding of debt, again, you know, uh, is uh, very similar to compounding interest. Now, um, the concept of fractional reserve lending. A well-known explanation of bank-created money is the concept of fractional reserve lending. This image is from a paper by economist Richard Werner, and the link is to his paper where he shows how banks create money. Supposedly, banks retain a fraction of deposits as a reserve, which cannot be lent out. In this example, with a 1% reserve, a $100 deposit becomes $9,900. But we see that the lending itself creates deposits, so the term fractional reserve is a misleading label for a money creation scheme. Of course, the system is more complicated than this. A basic requirement is there must be borrowers who will take the debt and banks who will make the loans, which leads to fluctuations and variations. There will be times when not enough debt is created or when people become excited and too much debt is created. A well-known example is the business cycle or credit cycle. Inflation propaganda. Inflation is treated as a rise in the price level instead of an increase in bank-issued debt. Rises in asset prices are usually not described as inflation. Economics propaganda places the cause of inflation as an increase in government printing of money, which denies the primary means of money creation, banking cartel credit. Economics propaganda also defines cost push inflation and demand pull inflation, in which wage increases are the main cause of inflation. In short, the public is constantly directed away from compounding bank debt as the cause of inflation. Inflation is seldom identified as necessary for the Fed monetary system, but the history of inflation is the strongest evidence. The proof is in the pudding, so to speak. Bank money creation is the way 97% of the money supply is created, so it is ridiculous to ignore the Federal Reserve System as the cause of monetary inflation. Uh, you see the two little graphs on the bottom of this slide. Uh, one is a standard scale on the left, and on the right you have the logarithmic scale. I have noticed that many graphs of economic data, including stock price charts, use a logarithmic scale instead of a standard scale. 
the logarithmic scale increases by powers of 10, which hides exponential monetary inflation by making it appear as an ordinary linear increase. So you can just look at these two little graphs and see that on the left, the standard scale, the uh, increments are, uh, you can see on the vertical axis, 100, 200, 300, 400. So it's going up by 100 each time. But on the right-hand side, the logarithmic scale, the increments are powers of 10. So it begins with 1 and then goes to 10 and then 100 and then 1,000. So this makes uh, exponential growth appear to be just a straight line rather than um, the, uh, the uh, curve, as you can see on the left-hand side, where it's very clear that you have uh, exponential growth. So now, uh, so far we have focused on the political nature of the Fed and how the actual facts are hidden or disguised in the information given to the public. But now we're going to match the loans to the money supply. So we'll look at some facts and figures from the available data. The credit issued by commercial banks is regarded as their assets since banks collect interest on these loans. As described earlier, these loans become the deposits that create the money supply. As expected, we see a very close relationship. Here we compare bank assets with the M2 money supply. After 2012, the M2 is a bit higher than the bank assets, which is probably a result of the Federal Reserve quantitative easing program, which began after the 2008 financial crisis. So you can see the red line is the bank assets and the blue line is the M2 money supply. And we will talk more about M2 uh, in just a minute. Okay, so the M1 money supply. M1, uh, these money supply figures are aggregates where different categories of money are added up together. Um, so the M1 includes money that is readily accessible for spending. It consists of currency, traveler's checks, demand deposits, and other checkable deposits such as draft accounts. The largest part of M1 is the demand deposits. M1 has roughly followed a 5.75% compound interest curve. The growth rate fell well below this 5.75% level in the 1990s until the 2008 financial crisis. After 2008, M1 has roughly followed a 9.6% rate of increase. This rapid increase was probably part of the bank bailout and quantitative easing programs. Recently, we have seen improvement in the economy as M1 has moved back up to the 5.75% compound interest curve. At the end of 2017, M1 was around $3.5 trillion. The M2 money supply. M2 is an aggregate that includes a broader set of financial assets held principally by households. M2 includes M1, cash and demand deposits, plus savings deposits, time deposits like CDs, and money market funds. The M2 increase has followed a compound interest rate of 6.6%, about 1% higher than the M1 aggregate. In 2017, M2 has risen to more than $14 trillion. The base money supply. The base money supply is the sum of currency, uh, Federal Reserve notes and coins, plus deposits in the Federal Reserve itself, which are the bank reserves. These reserve deposits are not available in the economy and are part of the internal bookkeeping of the Fed monetary system. The main components are treasury securities and agency mortgage-backed securities. The dramatic expansion during the quantitative easing program implies the possibility that there is a transformation of the Fed system underway. The, in, the inference is an attempt to insulate the system from debt deflation and insolvency by providing an arbitrary money source. As we have seen, the M2 money supply is dependent upon lending activity, which implies interaction with the public, while base money depends on Federal Reserve policy decided by an elite. Perhaps the Federal Reserve is laying the groundwork to be even more independent of federal government policy and democratic influence. 
Now we have a measure of the use of money and supply in, uh, in society. So this is the U.S. gross domestic product. Uh, the GDP measures the market value of the goods, services, and structures provided by the nation's economy in a particular period. GDP is a measure of money transactions based upon prices. The concept of money velocity is a measure of the turnover of money in the economy. The formula is V equals GDP divided by money. GDP has risen from $542 billion in 1960 to $19,845 billion in 2017. GDP was above the 6.6% .6 compound interest curve until the 2008 financial crisis. It appears to now be following a 4% compound rate. Total private credit. Private credit is the outstanding amount of credit extended to non-financial corporations, both public and private, households and non-profit institutions serving households. We must note that not all lenders have the privilege of creating money. There are many lenders such as finance companies or retail creditors who have savings or who borrow money and lend it at a higher rate, or they simply defer payment. So unlike the relationship between commercial bank assets and the money supply, private credit does not necessarily lead to growth in the money supply. Private credit has followed a compound rate of 8.6% or higher, uh, which is around 2% higher than the M2 money supply growth rate. Private credit grew from $393 billion in 1960 to $28,435 billion in 2018. Importantly, Usury laws that limited interest rates, fees, and penalties on consumer debts were seriously undermined in the late 1970s and 1980s. During this time, private credit grew at rates that were often well over 10%. This private credit data is an important indicator of how usury has become widespread in our economy, and I would suggest it is closely related to the growing social problems we have experienced. So now let's look more closely at total private credit. This slide is to give more information on the total private credit statistics. This slide shows the parts of the total private credit, credit to households and credit to non-financial corporations, as well as the amount said to be from banks. The growth of private credit is an indication of the expansion of the shadow banking sector. This term, shadow banking, refers to entities offering credit and financial services outside the coverage of regulations governing the banking sector. In fact, many banks engage in financial activities that are not reported as bank credit. These activities include off-balance sheet securitizations, that would be like asset-backed commercial paper, uh, hedge fund risk through off-balance sheet credit default swaps and other things, including uh, the uh, infamous uh, mortgage um, securities. According to the Bank of International Settlements data, banks provide around 35% of private credit in, in the United States in 2017. And this is from a paper called How Much Does the Private Sector Really Borrow? in the BIS Quarterly Review of March of 2013. However, the involvement of banks in shadow banking activities implies that we really do not know the level of bank involvement in this private credit data. Uh, and you can see the uh, chart. I think the, the uh, light green line uh, is the... Uh, is the amount that is sourced from banks according to the BIS data and then you have the uh, households and the uh, non-financial corporations stacked on top of each other and you can see that the total private credit has reached um, this level uh, pretty close to uh, 30,000 billion or uh, 30 trillion and that was in 2018. Uh, so now Let's compare M2, the GDP, and private credit. Both GDP and private credit are higher than M2. So in this graph, the uh, private credit is the, is the purple line on the top. The M2, uh, I'm sorry, the GDP is the blue line in the middle, and the M2 is the green line underneath. Uh, 
Since GDP is based on transactions, it makes sense that GDP would be higher than M2 because the same M2 dollar may be used for more than one transaction. Recall the money velocity concept. This graph shows that money velocity was 1.47 in 2017. And if you look on the right-hand side of the graph, there you have GDP being 147% of M2, which would translate to 1.47 in terms of money velocity. Private credit exceeded GDP in 1985 following the Reagan administration, when it and GDP were around 190% of M2. Private credit is usually compared only to GDP, but I want to compare it with the money available to pay the debt. Just before the 2008 financial crisis, private credit reached 328% of M2. In 2017, private credit was 214% of M2. Private credit is an important cause of financial instability, but it is, it is also a sign of the financialization of the economy as collecting interest becomes more profitable than other business activity. The tendency is clearly for debt growth to exceed money supply growth. So now let's look at another aspect of uh, the money system in the Federal Reserve, and that is the federal debt. Um, the federal debt has grown from $290 billion in 1960 to over $20,200 billion or $20 trillion in 2017. The federal debt has followed a compound rate of around 7.6%. At this rate, the doubling time is around nine years, or roughly two presidential terms. This implies that the federal debt will be around $40 trillion in 2027. This is used as a talking point in partisan propaganda, but the fact that politicians can borrow instead of tax tends to free them from democratic control. The federal debt is an important part of the Federal Reserve monetary system. We should recall that the income tax was instit instituted in 1913, as well as the Federal Reserve, at the same time as the Federal Reserve, so the government could support the debt. The federal debt treasury bond is used for bank reserves, used in financial markets, used for foreign treasury reserves, and used in foreign exchange markets. The treasury bond is not used in the domestic economy except as an investment. There are significant intragovernmental balances in the federal debt, so analyzing the federal debt is a topic in itself. At this point, we should realize that one problem we have in terms of paying the federal debt is where do we get the money without borrowing? Tax revenues would have to exceed expenditures for the federal debt to be paid, but this would interfere with the bank credit money creation process by reducing the money supply available for debt payments to banks. In fact, for this reason, balanced federal budgets are associated with economic recessions. Compare M2 and the federal debt. Some economists have said the federal debt is the source of money in the economy, but that is not reflected in the M2 money supply aggregate. This slide, show, uh, this slide shows that the relationship is more complicated. The Federal Reserve itself states that Treasury bonds can be used as reserves and they are used by the Fed to adjust the money supply. This is described as adding or removing liquidity by influencing bank lending activity. It is not in any way the source of M2. In 1960, the federal debt was 96% of M2 and dropped to 54% of M2 in 1974. In 1990, the federal debt exceeded M2, and in 2017, the federal debt was 152% of M2. According to the data series called the Federal Government Credit Market Instruments Liability Level from the St. Louis Fed, the total outstanding amount of Treasury debt instruments was around $17 trillion. Also, the 2017, the Treasury debt in the securities markets was reported by SIFMA to be $14.3 trillion. SIFMA is the acronym for the Securities Industry and Financial Markets Association. To get SIFMA data, search for SIFMA Treasury Issuance Outstanding. Uh, M2 has not followed either measure of federal debt very closely. 
So just to give a little bit more explanation on this slide, because people uh, don't really see this kind of stuff. You have the federal debt, which is the purple line on top, and that's what everyone talks about. But then there's the uh, orange line, which is the, um, the um, uh, credit instruments that have been issued. So that's treasury bonds, um, you know, various other instruments. I, I don't remember all the names, but um, those are out there in the economy, not in the economy, but they're in the financial markets. Um, and then there's the intergovernmental uh, um, debt, which is money that's owed to Social Security and other federal trust funds. And that's the difference between the um, credit instruments and the total federal debt. So um, they do basically kind of follow each other, but uh, they do not really relate very well to the M2. So that was the main point I wanted to make here and also how uh, the M2 money supply and the federal debt are not really um, as closely related as people might think. Okay, so now uh, interest on the federal debt. Uh, this is um, of some concern, I think. Uh, this chart shows interest on Treasury debt securities on a gross basis. The data is from uh, the whitehouse.gov slash OMB slash historical tables and specifically table 8.5 outlays for mandatory and related programs 1962 to 2023. The estimated net interest payments for uh, 2018 is 310 billion, which is about 8% of the federal budget. The intra-governmental interest payments are mainly to Social Security and other trust funds, as I said, and to the Federal Reserve. So um, the total uh, gross interest would be $504 billion, and uh, that's indicated there. So, And you can see that the um, interest payments are following the 7.6% compounding curve that also applies to the federal debt. And I have the 6.6% line uh, for M2, which is uh, underneath, showing how the interest payments are moving further and further away. Uh, and this is uh, the exponential pattern as, as you move out into compounding periods, the amounts uh, become more and more extreme. So um, now let's look at uh, the population and see how all of this relates to the people. So since 1929, the U.S. population has followed a 1.1% compound growth rate, and the population as of 2016 is estimated at 326 million. Now per capita money and debt. So M1, M2, federal debt, and private credit are divided by the population. This graph shows the amounts on a per-person basis. I simply divided the monetary aggregates by the U.S. population for each year. This is a graphic example of monetary inflation and the effect of the constant compounding of debt and debt money. In 1960, the federal debt plus private credit was 226% of M2, in 2016, the figure is 366%. So this is a graphic demonstration of how there is never enough money to pay the debt. And I have some numbers here just uh, for, uh, for to kind of dramatize this a little bit. In 1960, private credit was $2,176 per person, federal debt $1,607 per person, and M2 was $1,668 per person. And I talk about M1 here also, $792 per person. But M1 is included in M2, so let's don't be confused by that. Uh, now in 2017, uh, private credit is $87,000 per person, federal debt $52,000 per person, and the M2 money supply $41,000 per person. So now um, let's compare M2, M1, and the CPI. So the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, uh, and this is a well-known uh, measure of price inflation. It's used to calculate cost of living adjustments, and um, it's the general 
figure that's quoted in the media when they talk about inflation. So in other words, the media's reference to inflation is price inflation as measured by the uh, consumer price index. How much do things cost rather than how much money is there? The money supply has inflated much more than the CPI and inflation adjusted or CPI adjusted wages would not have increased anywhere near the increases in the monetary aggregates. So M2 uh, has shown a 4,000% increase, M1 a 2,000% increase, and the CPI has shown a 700% increase. And this is from 1960 up to 2016. Okay. The Federal Reserve Monetary System forces debt onto the public. The Fed banking cartel has one primary source of power and influence, and that is money creation, as we've said. Banks issue money by lending for activities they favor, and they use credit to influence or manipulate markets. Through lobbying and manipulation of the economy, the banking cartel and the corporations it finances are able to direct public policy to support ever-increasing debt. Federal military spending and student debt are well-known examples. Another example is policies that promote suburban development and automobile dependence. The activities that banks favor tend to create higher future demand for credit and bank money. And because the process of issuing money through debt, these activities are those where loans will be repaid. Payment is likely when the borrower either wants to repay or must repay the loan. I call this carrots or sticks. A carrot situation is where borrowers believe they will profit from price inflation using leverage. On the other side, there's the stick of necessity and lack of choice where people feel they must go into debt. And there's inflation itself that raises prices and creates a need for more money. So now an example of a banking cartel credit. Uh, a carrot, I'm sorry, banking cartel carrot. So this is the inducement or the an activity that's rewarded. The real estate market is an example of a banking cartel carrot. In this graph, the market value curve is much higher than the mortgage debt curve, but one reason is that around 34% of homes are owned free and clear of mortgage debt. While many people have no mortgage debt and high equity in their homes, the equity in mortgage property is not as high as it might appear. This graph shows the basis of potential profits from real estate speculation. The compound rate of increase in real estate value is around 8.6% up until 2008. Interestingly, the compound rate of increase in mortgage debt was around 9.6% up until 2008. And I don't show those curves on the graph, but I did calculate them. And it's kind of one of those things about uh, compound interest. You know, the, uh, the, um, the mortgage value or the real estate value um, starts at a higher amount. And so the curve appears to be going up faster, but the compounding rate is actually 1% less because the uh, mortgage debt um, starts at a lower amount and uh, relatively speaking, it goes up more. So um, property price inflation assures that mortgage loans will be repaid because the market value will usually be higher than the loan balance. Thus, property price inflation is essential to the banking cartel. Higher prices also increase the need for credit. Real estate inflation has come to be an integral feature of the property market, funded by banks loaning higher amounts each year. The expectation of real estate price inflation is deeply embedded in consumer psychology. Now, another uh, area that's rewarded by the uh, financial system. Um, this chart shows the S&P uh, 500 stock market index. The Federal Reserve is very concerned about the stock market. The justification I have heard is the wealth effect and the constant references to the stock market as a barometer of economic health and vitality. I suspect there are really two primary reasons for the Federal Reserve concern. Number one, a stock market crash can begin a large debt deflation and bring the system down. 
and two, the stock market is part of the banking cartel control system. This is how uh, they exercise a lot of control over corporations, besides most corporations having uh, large debt to the banking cartel. Um, there are many reports of how the Federal Reserve member banks own controlling interest in most of the listed corporations, at least the large ones on the stock market. It is a means of expanding economic control by financing corporate actors, and it provides speculative profits. We see here that despite great fluctuations, the S&P 500 has followed a 6.6% compounding curve from 1960 to the present. So now the other side, examples of banking cartel sticks. The installment or non-revolving debt level shown represents debts which are difficult for people to avoid. On the left hand side you have the installment uh, or non-revolving uh, credit outstanding and on the right hand side is a depreciation graph. Uh, education and auto loans are the main components of the installment debt uh, data here. Auto debt was 1.2 trillion in 2017 and has been leveling off in recent years which may be partly due to an increase in automobile leasing. Student debt was near 1.5 trillion in 2017. It is interesting that the leveling off of car loans was compensated for by the increase in student debt to maintain the 6.6% growth rate. Automobiles are a necessity which must be replaced every few years, but automobiles depreciate at around 20% per year. This means the car owner will rarely have much equity and have to get a substantial new loan every few years. According to the internet, the average new car price is now around $30,000 but the car is worth less than $10,000 in six years. Depending on the price per gallon, the average American pays between $1,400 and $2,500 per year for gasoline, around $1,500 per year for auto insurance, and around $800 per year for interest on their automobile loan. This means over the six-year use, the out-of-pocket cost is around $23,000, and with depreciation, the cost is over $43,000 assuming no major repairs or accidents. In my opinion, the two examples of real estate inflation and automobile dependency are crucial to understanding the Federal Reserve System. The suburban sprawl infrastructure that characterizes most of the United States is optimized for banking cartel profits and monetary inflation. It should not be a surprise that the banking cartel finances the developers who build the suburban infrastructure. If you have the idea of living in the suburbs and riding a bicycle, or riding the bus to get around, you will find this simply won't work. The suburban infrastructure does not permit any alternative to the automobile. This is also the support for manufacturing and the fossil fuel industry, as well as home improvements, furnishings, and other forms of consumerism. Living the suburban lifestyle usually means mortgage payments, car payments, and credit card payments. It does not take very much imagination to see how the banking cartel and its supporters have arranged American society so as to maximize their control and profits. So this next slide kind of focuses on student debt. Student debt has risen from 480 billion in 2006 to 1,524 billion in 2018. This data series only goes back to 2006 but the growth rate roughly matches a 9.6% compound rate. Student debt is relatively new area for debt expansion. The social consequences of indenturing young people for their education are being experienced, and the growing demands for student debt relief and free education represent a possible setback for the banking cartel. Now, consumer credit card debt. Total revolving credit owned and securitized and outstanding. This uh, is the name of the data series. Uh, it's an aggregate of consumer credit such as credit cards. Um, consumer revolving credit exploded from 1.4 billion in 1968 to 38.8 billion in 1978. And again, this is when the usury laws and uh, other uh, consumer protection laws were repealed. 
and it is nearly $1 trillion at this time. From 1978 to 2008, it roughly followed a pattern of 11% compound interest. Um, and now, in uh, after the financial crash of 2008, we see that it dropped down and it appears to be increasing again. Now, you know, the revolving credit, um, just to give you an idea uh, where that word comes from, you know, you have a credit limit, you can borrow up to the credit limit, then you have to pay it down, and then you can borrow some more, then you pay that down and borrow some more. And so that's visualized as revolving. So that's why it's called revolving credit. Okay, so now uh, total consumer credit. So now we're looking at an aggregate of consumer debt. This is the total for the categories we have just seen. This includes car loans, credit card debt, personal loans, and student debt. Consumer credit has grown from $61 billion in 1960 to $3,830 billion in 2017. An annual compounding rate of 7.6% is shown by the red line, showing that consumer credit overall is growing faster than the M2 money supply. The total consumer debt of around $4 trillion plus the plus the real estate mortgage debt of around $10 trillion kind of matches up with the M2 money supply. Um, income inequality. So this is the next slide here. I just kind of threw this in. I, it's very difficult to find um, statistics that relate uh, the uh, money system to income inequality. And, you know, obviously those statistics are just simply not published. Uh, from the website inequality.org, Americans in the top 1% average over 40 times more income than the bottom 90%, but that gap pales in comparison to the divide between the nation's top 1% and everyone else. Americans at the top 0.1% uh, are taking in over 198 times the income of the bottom 90%. So, um, So I, I, let's, there's a little bit of information on this. There was, this is from, uh, this uh, graph is from a paper uh, by Professor Emmanuel Saiz called Striking It Richer, the Evolution of Top Incomes in the United States. And then there's uh, a whole nother study that was done in Germany uh, many years ago. Um, and it's reported on a website called themoneysyndrome.org. And they discuss a book called The Money Syndrome by Helmut Krutz. And in that book, he calculates the net interest income in the economic classes. So uh, the lower classes tend to pay uh, a lot more interest than they receive, while the upper class receives a lot more interest than they pay. So um, the, uh, the higher you are in the economic uh, hierarchy, the more interest income you get and the more uh, debt is a benefit to you. Now, some implications. Credit and debt must be inflated by any means available, inducements and ensnarements or debt traps, with student debt being the most recent example of the banking cartel imposing debt on the public. The Federal Reserve monetary system has been compared to a Ponzi scheme because of the constant need for new debt. American society has been shaped by the banking cartel agenda and politics is driven by the constant need to compound debt. Monetary inflation has continued through numerous doubling periods, making the absolute amounts much greater and less manageable. There have been 57 annual compounding periods from 1960 to 2017, so we are just entering the phase where the exponential growth becomes overwhelming. And if you recall, the very or earlier on, I had the graph of the compound interest pattern, and you know it was in period seventy-two that um, the amount uh, of one dollar that it began with had risen up to close to a hundred, and then uh, then it was to two hundred in period eighty-three, and then it was four hundred in period ninety-four. So that's um, that's the pattern. Conclusion. Compound interest rules. Exponential growth, modeled by compound interest, is the defining pattern of the Federal Reserve monetary system. 
The monetary supply is a reflection of credit issued by the banking cartel, using their privilege of creating money. Economic growth is a term to describe monetary inflation in a favorable light, but in fact this growth is simply the constant effort to compound debt by justifying new loans and creating financial bubbles. We experience this through exponential monetary inflation. There will never be enough money to pay the debt at any given time, so the system must maintain exponential growth by compounding debt in order to function. So um, that uh, wraps up the slideshow that I had, and uh, thank you very much uh, for watching. Um, so, um, you know, I became interested in this topic as a result of trying to understand why politicians and the media were so unwilling to address climate change. I came to realize the needs of the banking cartel and the Federal Reserve monetary system we're directly opposed to the actions we need to address global warming and environmental degradation. Control of the money system by an oligarchic elite is the foundation of corporate power. In fact, we have seen an ever greater concentration of power in the hands of this credit-based elite, and this presentation has shown some of how that process works. To support that elite in the face of climate change and social unrest, Denial has become the philosophy of the establishment. When you cannot solve a problem, denying there is a problem will serve a psychological need. While many are concerned about the financial cost of adapting to climate change, I hope you see that the cost to oligarch power is the real concern. So while the political theater continues, the actual policies are all about the needs of the banking cartel. The necessary compounding of debt and need for more bank money is maintained by military spending, suburban sprawl, fossil fuel consumption, and consumerism in general. Corporate control of resources and economic sectors such as health care, agriculture, and transportation is funded by the banking cartel and great effort is made to prevent competition or alternatives from arising. Of course, global warming is not the only problem which is worsened by the Federal Reserve monetary system. But global warming makes it clear. The future under the banking cartel is dismal and hopeless. Please make it your business to question the money system and demand reform to make the money system into one which serves the public interest and is appropriate for the future. And again, thank you very much for watching and I wish you the best and good luck to you.